Hello, I'm Laura McCaukey, your host for this evening, and welcome again to the first night of Soapbox Science Sydney 2020. We've had two great talks so far this evening, and we'll round off the night with another great talk from Dr. Natalie Mattison. Before we get started, though, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation upon whose ancestral lands UTSE City Campus, from which we are streaming, now stands. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. I'll start with a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during tonight's webinar, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel, and we'll ask our speaker these over the duration of her talk. You can ask questions anonymously, and also if you would like a question answered that someone else has asked, then please use the upvoting tool, which is the wee thumbs up symbol next to the question itself. This session will also be recorded, but will not be recording any video or audio input from the audience. If you have any concerns or questions over this, you can contact the Soapbox team via email at soapboxsciencesydney at gmail.com. You may be wondering what Soapbox Science is, or you may have come across it in its original pre-COVID format, which is researchers standing on soapboxes, wearing lab coats in very busy public places like shopping centres or Circular Quay, where we had Sydney's first Soapbox Science event last year. The premise behind both the in-person and online Soapbox Science events is for the public to interact with, question and probe some of our nation's most fabulous researchers in science, technology, engineering and maths. We want these events to be as interactive as possible, so please ask questions as we go along. Our brilliant speaker tonight is Dr Natalie Mattison, who in her own words is a mother, a mermaid and a brain biologist studying stress when she is often stressed. Natalie leads a lab at the University of Wollongong where her research looks into how stress can cause people to develop mental illness. She does this using tiny slivers of donated brains from people who have now died but who lived with mental illness and had very stressful lives. I won't take up any more time introducing Natalie as I want to hear as much as possible about this fascinating research. Over to you, Natalie. Thanks, Laura, and hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here tonight, and I can't wait to tell you a little bit about what I do and um, the contribution that we're making to science. So whenever someone asks me what I do for work, I think it always ends up being an interesting conversation because I'm a molecular. I'm a molecular neurobiologist, and usually as soon as I say this, people's faces cloud over, but really it's just a fancy way to say that I'm a biologist that studies the brain. And more specifically, I'm a post-mortem brain biologist. So I study the brains of people who have now died to understand the cellular and molecular structure of the brain and how it might be different in people who have a brain illness compared to those that don't. So now I'm really curious what kinds of images this can just for you about what this kind of work looks like. And maybe you're imagining zombies, or maybe you've got an image of me sitting in a dark morgue performing Y cuts. But studying cells and molecules in the postmortem brain isn't about getting a whole brain and dissecting it and studying it anatomically like you might see Gunther von Hagens do on the TV show Anatomy for Beginners. It's also nothing like performing neurosurgery. Of course, these tissues still need to be prepared for research, but this is done by neuropathologists who are medical doctors that specialize in brain diseases and anatomy. And this is done with other specialized scientists at brain banks, which are places that collect and store brain specimens for research before it reaches researchers like me. So the types of samples that I study are, are tiny. They're only a few milligrams of tissue, no bigger than the size of a pea. And they're usually mushed up into a liquid in tiny test tubes, or they're cut up super, super thin and placed onto microscope slides about the size of the tip of my thumb. So obviously I couldn't show you a real brain specimen tonight because they need to stay in the lab. Um, but I thought I would just give you an idea about what it's actually like. So the reason that we study the postmortem human brain is that it allows us to look at a level of detail that's just not possible yet to do in living people. And there are three main things that I want to share with you that's possible to study in the human postmortem brain. So the first thing is looking at the molecular makeup of the brain and how it might differ in people with mental illness. 
So um, our brain, like the rest of our body, is made up of really tiny units called cells. And those cells are made up of even tinier units called molecules. And sometimes the amounts and proportions of molecules in cells and the number of cells also can change in the process of illness. So if we can identify these points of difference, it means that we can discover targets for new drugs that can improve patient symptoms. Um, for example, we can develop new antidepressants for the treatment of depression. The second thing that we can do with the postmortem human brain is that we can study the physical characteristics of brain cells and how they're different in people with brain illness compared to those that have healthy brains. So brain cells are connected to each other and they communicate through these connections. So each brain cell has about a thousand connections which determine how that cell talks to other cells and how well, that cell, how well the cells and how well the brain functions. So sometimes in brain illnesses, the physical characteristics of cells can change, affecting how those cells connect and interact with each other. And understanding these processes gives us better insight into how the illness happens in the first place and then potentially how we can correct them. So we can also investigate how people's life experiences influence the makeup of their brain. So more recent advancements in science tell us that everything we experience in life has an effect on our brain, especially by being woven into the fabric of our DNA. And this includes feeling the sunshine on our skin to smelling freshly brewed coffee to our interactions with the people in our social networks. But when those experiences are very stressful or even traumatic, they can have a detrimental effect on our brain and affect our, brain's, our brain cells capacity to function. So in the most extreme circumstances, this can lead to brain illnesses like post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD and depression. So that's a very um, brief and quick introduction uh, to what it is that I do as a postmodern brain biologist. And I'd love to turn the mic over um, to you now and answer some questions. So back over to you, Laura. Thanks, Natalie. That was a really great quick introduction. Um, we've got the results to your poll. Um, the question was, what images come to your head when you think about what studying post-mortem brains looks like? We had 67%, so two thirds of people say a morgue. 10% um, said zombies and 20% said neurosurgery. Yeah, um, really what do you think about that? <laughs> well, I have to say that I kind of expected the morgue answer, but um, that's really not a job for me. I don't think I could be in the dark um, with dead people all day. <laughs> okay, we've got quite a few questions. Um, what are brain banks? You mentioned a brain bank. Yeah, so brain banks are scientific labs that exist around the world. And what they do, um, or what their primary function is, is to um, get donations um, from people that lived with a mental illness, um, in, in my case, or lived with some kind of illness or disease. Um, and also healthy people as well, because we need um, comparison subjects. And, um, and what the brain banks do is they work at getting donations. And then um, when someone dies, they collect the brain and they keep it for research purposes. So um, it's actually quite a complicated process. And uh, when, when someone dies and, um, and they have elected to donate their brain to science, um, a neuropathologist needs to go out, they need to perform a general autopsy. Um, and then when they deem that the brain is okay to take for research, it needs to be um, taken out of the person's body and taken to the brain bank where it is uh, dissected and stored in a very specific way um, for research. So usually what happens is that the brain is cut in half and half the brain gets frozen and half the brain gets fixed in something like formaldehyde. And the reason for this is that depending on what we're going to do with uh, the brain experimentally for research, it needs to be stored in different ways. Um, so essentially this is what brain banks do. They're the people and the scientists um, and the doctors that, um, that, that are part of this process and the brain banks are the houses where these brain specimens are stored. Um, I have a question just from when you mentioned that half the brain gets frozen and half gets stored in formaldehyde. How do you choose which half gets which? Because all the different areas of the brain do different things. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So um, 
and, and I think sometimes it can also be an issue because there are some um, structures in the brain that are not what we call bilateral. So they don't, they're not exactly the same on both sides. And in general, they're not exactly the same on both sides as well. So um, I'm not a hundred percent, but my understanding on this is that every second brain has the opposite hemisphere frozen oh. and and that um, we also take this information into account in our statistical analysis as well, because we want to make sure that when we're seeing um, something biological, that it's not just because it's an effect um, from the brains predominantly being from one, one hemisphere or one half of the brain. Um, and so that's something that we account for statistically too. Um, this is another question related to preserving the brains. Um, Yilian wants to know, how do you prepare like preserve them so that the connections between the brain cells aren't broken? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so actually when we freeze um, post-mortem brain samples or fix them in um, formaldehyde, which are fixatives, um, it, it actually preserves the tissue quite well. And, um, some, and, and they can be stored for very long periods of time. We are using brain samples in our lab that have been stored for sometimes seven, 10, 15 years, um, either frozen at minus 80 degrees, um, so very, very, very cold, um, or they've been fixed immediately once they were collected um, from the person that died. And uh, we do a lot of studies in our labs looking at brain cells um, and, uh, and, and, and looking at their connections, but not always looking at their connections. Sometimes we just look at their physical shape and we can make inferences about their connections. Um, but yeah, the, the, the fixing and the storage methods are actually quite good. Hmm. That's good to know. We don't want to be testing these things on live participants. <laughs> um... Someone has asked, I've ticked organ donor on my license. Mm -hmm. Does that mean my brain can be donated to science? No, they're two different things. Um, so when you uh, donate your organs, um, which is what you would tick on your license, um, this has to do with um, potentially being able to donate your organs to someone who's in a life and death situation. They might need a lung transplant or a heart transplant or kidney transplant, and um, you might happen to be a donor that can save someone. Um, but donating your brain to science for research purposes is a different process. Um, so I'll talk about a little bit more about that later on. But um, yeah, if this is something you're interested in doing, then hopefully I'll be able to give you the information that you need. That would be interesting to know. I can't wait to hear about it. Um, we've got another few questions here. Um, what types of experiments do you do to understand the effects of stress on the brain, as your talk title alludes to? Yeah, so I'm going to be expanding on this a lot more. Um, so a lot of the um, experiments that we do are staining type experiments. So we get these um, slides uh, which have slices of brain tissue on them and we're able to stain them with certain chemicals that enable us to visualize the cells under a microscope. And so we do a lot of experiments actually physically looking at the cells to see how they are changed. And we also do a lot of experiments just using um, mushed up tissue. Um, and what this allows us to do is we can extract all different kinds of molecules from the tissue like DNA, RNA and proteins, um, which enable us to uh, look at how the levels of proteins and molecules of interest might be different um, across mental illnesses. Um, and so what we're able to do is the brain tissues that we study are either classified as people that have a mental illness or people who don't, or in some cases, people that have specific stress histories as well as mental illness. And um, by analyzing the levels of molecules in all of the, in all of the different groups, we can compare those and then we can um, find out if uh, there are differences um, between people that have mental illness compared to um, people who don't. Oh, I think it might be a problem in the future when you're trying to get non-stressed brains to use as a control. Because I think in COVID, yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. In terms of time, I want to hear more about your research. Um, so I'll hand back over to you, and then we'll continue this question and answer again in a few minutes. I want to talk to you about stress because this is a really important aspect of my study. So we all experience stress every day to varying degrees. It's what gets us out of bed in the morning, makes us motivated to study, and it keeps us on time. So this type of stress isn't necessarily bad, and it's a normal facet of life. 
So sometimes we can be exposed to more severe stresses, like having a car accident or being held up at a bank, um, going through a messy divorce or unstable work. And some people have jobs where they experience these types of events often, like police officers or paramedics. And for many people in the world, they're exposed to severe stresses for long periods of time, like living through a war where there's constant threat of combat and death. And sometimes when stress is this severe, um, where it's about situations um, that are a matter of life and death, this can have a really permanent or long lasting effect on the brain and the body. So there's a part of our brain, which is called the hypothalamus. And when we perceive a stress, it sets off our stress response. The hypothalamus releases hormones into our bloodstream, which start a cascade of interactions in our body that allows us to respond to the stress. So one of the outcomes of this is that we release cortisol, um, which I'm sure you've all heard of. It's the main stress hormone in our body and adrenaline, which is the other hormone which pumps up our body in case we need to flee from a stressor. So like if we were faced with a tiger and we suddenly needed to run away. So stress has so many effects on our body and our different organs, which I'm sure you're familiar with. In the brain, it can cause headaches, feelings of despair, lack of energy and trouble sleeping. Um, it can make our hearts beat faster and stronger. In our stomachs, we can feel nausea, stomach aches and heartburn. And on our skin, we can feel sweat. So in healthy people, when the stress has passed, the stress response turns off. However, for some people, their stress response is dysfunctional and they have a prolonged stress response even after the stress is no longer present. And this dysfunctional prolonged stress response over long periods of time can have really serious effects on our body and its ability to function. So the prolonged stress response is linked to the development of mental illness. And in fact, it's among the strongest risk factors alongside genetics. So what is it that makes some people vulnerable to the effects of stress while others are not? Well, this is a key area of research and we don't fully understand the basis for what makes some people resilient to stress while others are vulnerable. But we do know that some genes are involved, as is the kind of stresses that people are exposed to and the time in their life when the stress occurs. So for example, being exposed to childhood stress is incredibly detrimental to our brains. During childhood, um, our brains are really vulnerable because they're developing and research suggests that childhood stress can actually reshape and rewire our brains permanently. And that this uh, might be what sets at least some individuals on a trajectory to develop a mental illness later in life. Uh, or it can just make them more susceptible to mental illnesses, if, even if they don't develop one, like post-traumatic stress disorder and depression when they become adults. So this is a global concern. We have more adults reporting extreme le levels of stress than ever before. We have traumatized populations like refugees on the rise. There are currently over 70 million people in the world who are forcibly displaced from their homes, mainly due to war. Now we have an added layer of stress being that we're, the fact being that we're in a global pandemic um, and the whole world feels like they're on the edge of their seat to a degree due to COVID. And there's now data to suggest that mental illness in this respect is already on the rise and that people that have pre-existing mental illnesses are really not doing well under these conditions. People are experiencing more cumulative effects of stress. We have increased everyday pressures, high pressure jobs, caring responsibilities. Kids um, are now exposed to the internet and the effects of social media. Um, a lot of them are also struggling with the isolation that's associated with COVID. They're not able to have those, um, those social interactions that they used to and that they need. Um, and many people are now reporting an inability to switch off and relax. So there's also data emerging suggesting that trauma can be biologically transmitted across generations, meaning that these stresses and traumas are not just affecting traumatized populations now, but they're also um, affecting offspring in the generations to come. So to develop preventatives and to identify periods of intervention, it's really critical that we start to understand how different types, durations and timings of stress affect the brain and the body. So what molecules are altered? In which cells does this occur? And what are the behavioral consequences of this? 
And it's really only with this information that we can develop new ways forward. And this is where my research comes in. So I'm going to tell you more about that in the next section. Um, so we can um, also have a quick break now and answer more questions. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Natalie. Um, we do have a lot of questions um, and it's just, it's really, your talk's very timely with COVID um, because as you touched on, like everybody's undergoing stress um, and a lot of stress that we're not used to, um, especially in isolation. Um, yeah. So our first question is, are the changes of after stress permanent or can they be reversed? Yeah, this is a really good question. So I think we don't understand this process properly, but um, I think we have, well, I would hypothesize that there will be some effects of stress um, that could be permanent um, and perhaps they can't be reversed, but then there are also other effects of stress that can be. So for example, um, that we it's been shown in animal studies we can't do these experiments in humans but in mice and in rodents that have been through really stressful situations um experimentally so they've been um, purposely stressed um, and then uh, we've studied their behavior their molecules and their cells um, that they have uh, they have this stress response that can cause permanent changes in their brains and molecules um, and then if you take those same animals and put them into a nurturing environment, you can reverse a lot of these effects. And actually, um, it's animal studies that have predominantly shown that we are able to have this, what they call transgenerational transmission of trauma. So the stress can be passed, the biological effects of stress can be passed on to offspring and um, even after two and three generations. But if you place those animals into a nurturing environment where they're no longer stressed and actually they are able to live to their full potential, um, you can reverse a lot of these, um, if not all of these effects. So I think it's an evolving field. We don't fully have all of the answers yet, but um, it's probably a bit of both. Well, that's at least promising that it's not forever. Um, yeah. Especially having young children. Um, if I should <laughs> yeah. We hope is not. <laughs> yeah, I relate. <laughs> We have another question, it's a bit more left of field. What is the most surprising thing you've learned about the brain? Oh, wow. Um, hmm. I think that the most incredible thing that I've learned about the brain is that as adults, we have the ability or our brains have the ability in certain specialized areas of the brain to make new cells. Um, and so it was originally thought that we, and, and if you look at textbooks from even 10, 20 years ago, um, it would say this, that we were, we were only born with a certain amount of brain cells. And when they died, that was it. But actually there's new information now to suggest that actually um, our brains can re in a way regenerate. And so after um, traumatic brain injury or um, stroke, that our brains have a, uh, probably a limited, but we do have a capacity to generate more cells in special areas. And these can actually be, they, they migrate or they move to the places in the brain where we need them. And I think that that's just the most incredible thing um, that I've ever learned about the human brain. That is really cool. Um, and to know that we are still making new brain cells is a good thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you detect multiple levels of deformities in brain cells harvested from the one person? Or is it usually one type of um, problem with the brain cells that's going on? Yeah, um, I think that there's multiple things happening. So we have uh, many, many different types of cells in our brain, um, but classically we have four different types that it, um, that um, that we have in. So one of them is neurons, um, which are like the main cell type, and then we have um, three other cell types that come under a cluster called glia. And they have different functions. Um, and basically, yeah, th there's all different kinds of effects going on. So I think it depends on the brain area that we're looking at. So the brain is very complex and different areas have different cellular, cellular compositions and they also have different functions. Some are more involved in some processes than others. So I think depending on which mental illness you have, uh, which symptoms you display, 
um, and also the environmental exposures that you've had. So for example, if you have a biology that's really strongly related to a stress response, you're more likely to have uh, changes that are happening in the brain areas that process the stress response. So um, yeah, I, I mean, we don't know everything about this yet. This is why we're doing this research because we really need to catalog these changes in order to fully understand what's happening. And then that's how we'll be able to develop uh, more effective treatments. As usual, the answer from the researcher is we need more research. Yeah. <laughs> it's always the way. And that's why science is so interesting because you answer one question and it opens up a million more. That's right. Uh, I want to hear more about your research. So we'll hand back over to you and then we'll finish up with a QA and a in a few minutes. So um, I want to talk to you now about my research specifically and what we're doing in our lab. So we often hear people say after a traumatic event that they were never the same. And actually the science suggests that maybe they weren't, that maybe the stress caused a long lasting uh, change in their brain function and they were actually never the same. So my research specifically focuses on how stress contributes to the development of mental illnesses like depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, one in five Aussies, Aussies experience a mental disorder every year, and almost half will experience a mental disorder in their lifetime. So stress is one of the strongest risk factors for the development of mental illness along with genetics. And for some illnesses like depression, stress is actually even a stronger risk factor than genetics. So we're all exposed to stress in our life and most, if not all of us, carry some gene variants that are involved in mental illness, but only a proportion of us go on to develop a mental health condition. So why is that? Well, it's a, key, it's a key question in the field and understanding why this is might hold the key to treating mental illnesses more effectively. So certain genes carried by some people can increase the risk of developing a mental health condition. We know that mental illnesses can run in family, in families, but it's not always the case that there's a history of it in the family. Environmental risk factors can include severe stress, long-term stress, stress or traumas, particularly those that are occurring early in life, because during that time, the brain's quite vulnerable to the effects of stress, and this can set an individual on the path to mental illness later in life. So in my current line of research, my lab is working on characterizing the changes in the brain that occur after stress and in mental illness at the levels of cells and molecules. And by identifying how they're different, we hope to find new targets for drugs that could potentially correct some of these detrimental effects. So over the last 10 years, I found over 20 protein molecules that had changed in specialized brain areas of people with mental illness. And my research focuses on brain areas that are particularly involved in the stress response. So these include the prefrontal cortex, um, which is the front area of your brain, the hippocampus, which is a deep structure, which has a lot to do with how we remember events, and the amygdala, which is a brain area that has a lot to do with how we identify um, and then um, process events with fear. So one target, uh, molecular target, that I've been focusing on um, is a gene called FKBP5. It's a key molecule in the stress response that plays a role in how our cells take up and respond to that main um, stress hormone, cortisol. So work from my lab and my mentor's lab indicates that people who carry a genetic variant of the FKPP5 gene, who have also been exposed to childhood trauma, have higher levels of the FKPP5 molecule in their brain. And this leads to changes in how their bodies process cortisol um, and causes them to have a prolonged stress response. And over time, this inability to turn off the stress response appropriately may increase their risk of developing a mental illness. And what's most promising about the FKPP5 molecule is that in animal studies, mainly in mouse studies, drugs that target FKPP5 seem to have good antidepressant effects and also good anxiolytic effects. So they work well against anxiety symptoms. And there are many efforts at the moment to determine whether they'll be useful in people, human beings, who have the FKPP5 variant, who experienced childhood trauma, and who developed a mental illness as well. 
So another stream of research in our lab is looking at how the physical characteristics of brain cells might change after exposure to stress. So um, my incredible student, Dominic, has been leading this project and he's looking at a brain area called the orbitofrontal cortex. So this is a part of your brain that sits just above your eye sockets. So your eyes are called, um, your eye sockets are called the orbits. Um, so orbitofrontal cortex, and it plays a role in regulating emotions and social behavior. So it also acts as a kind of switchboard that integrates signals from all kinds of important brain areas. And what Dominic's found is that in people who have been exposed to severe stress, like abuse and neglect, that the shapes of their brain cells have changed. They have less of the sites that allow the cells to connect to other cells, meaning that the way that the brain is wired in this brain area is likely altered. And this means that all the processes that the orbitofrontal cortex um, has a role in, like emotional regulation, which is super important um, for depression, where we have big changes in mood, and changes in social behavior, which is a symptom which is common um, or commonly seen in many mental illnesses, may be affected as well as the ability for the orbitofrontal cortex to work at being that switchboard that's able to integrate and connect all of the signals from the different brain areas. So those are some specific examples of the work we do and um, I'd love to answer any more questions you might have. I only just touched on the iceberg so I'm sure that um, there's a lot more to ask and to learn. Yeah we do have a lot more questions coming through. Um, we'll start with how um, how is the work translated into development of treatments? So my work specifically is looking at what we would call basic research. So it's really trying to understand what are the processes and um, potential drug targets. So I think as we heard from Nisha's talk that the development of drugs takes a really long time. It's a really complicated process and it has to go through many, many different phases. So the first step is really to find like what could potentially work as a drug target. And then we tend to do a lot of studies manipulating those targets, usually in animal models, because we need to see how they affect behavior. We can also study um, more cellular and molecular effects and pathways um, if we look at them in, um, in a cell culture that's grown in a dish. And so we have to go through all of these processes before, um, and, and we have to find that the targets are good. Then we have to go through all of the medicinal chemistry side of things where we can actually develop a drug um, that is very, um, uh, well, it has utility. So especially when we're looking at the brain, because drugs have to be, um, they have to be designed in a specific way that they're actually able to get transported into the brain and they reach um, the 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 places that we that we need it, and um, and so it's quite a complicated process. So my research is really focusing on that very first stage where we're just identifying the drug targets. We really need to know what exactly is going on in there, and um, and then we form hypotheses about how we could potentially correct it, and then that there those are future um, scientific research avenues. We do have a question related to something that you touched on there, but it might be too far down the pipeline for you, but. How do we get different interventions into the different parts of the brain specifically? Because you've mentioned that it's different parts of the brain that are affected by stress. Yeah, yeah so this is a really um, big problem uh, in drug development um, for the brain and for mental illnesses in particular, because um, previously during my PhD, I worked on the glutamate system. And um, we had some really good um, kind of candidates that were helpful for um, targeting a specific um, like chemistry um, in the brain, which is the glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter um, that has a really strong role in, um, well, many mental illnesses, but I was focusing on schizophrenia. And um, the issue with these drugs is that so they're non-specific. They go into the brain, but we can't really get them to bind exactly where we want them to. But in saying that, there's also much more um, sophisticated medicinal chemistry techniques available now that um, are able to uh, target more specific types of receptors or, and proteins and molecules. So sometimes the molecules that are expressed in our brain, if we get lucky, are specific to one particular brain area. 
And so um, we can um, develop drugs that are specific for those. And if we are able to get them into the brain, they can go to that particular region and, um, and, and they will reach where you want them and they will be specific. But that's not always the case. And this is definitely one of the um, huge issues with um, why we don't always have um, effective treatments for people with mental illness. The, the, the medication is really difficult to develop. You mentioned your protein is FKKP5. Um, two questions about this. Is this a specific um, protein? And how do you quantify this molecule when you look at it in the brains? Yeah, so it is a specific um, molecule. And um, the way that we quantify it is that um, well, we can do it at a, at a couple of levels. So one level is at the gene level. So we know um, where it is in the gene and we can do genotyping um, to see which variant of the gene someone carries. Um, the other thing we can do is um, a technique which we, which we call uh, PCR. And that has to do with um, looking at the levels of the mRNA. Um, so we can look at gene expression. So um, uh, some people might remember from their biology days that we have genes, um, genes get transcribed into mRNA, and then that gets translated into proteins. And um, this is kind of the cascade of how we get from our DNA to functional molecules in our cells that um, actually have, um, a, a, well, they all have a function, but, um, but the, the proteins are more of the um, pathways in the cell and de determining um, the the functions of the cell and so yeah we can we have techniques that are able to look at all levels so we can look at the gene we can look at the mrna which is like the messenger um, and that gets translated into the protein and at the protein level we use antibodies um, that are specific for these particular proteins um, and often they're fluorescently tagged which means that um, when we put them under a laser they light up and then that enables us to visualize them under the microscope that sounds really cool. And I'm sure you make lots of pretty images with that. Um, I'm going to throw out a big question here to you. Is mental illness caused by nature or nurture or both? Uh, so we know it's very accepted in the field now that mental illness is not caused um, solely by genetics or by the environment. It's actually the interaction of both. And there's a lot of research being done at the moment, which factors in both. And actually um, the work that I'm doing on FKPP5, we call these gene by environment studies because we're looking at how um, the genes interact with the environment and often um, the most detrimental um, environmental exposure that we have is stress. Um, so yeah, it's not either, it's a combination of them. So a lot of the time, as I mentioned during the talk, we, uh, we all have, um, we all carry genes that are involved in mental illness. Mental illnesses are not characterized by just one or two genes. We have pretty much um, hundreds of genes that are involved and they all have different weights and they all contrib contribute um, differentially across people. And so, um, yeah, but just for some people, they just have a particular cascade of genetic, um, of this genetic signature that if they have an environmental trigger, um, they can, it can raise their risk. And um, for many people, they can go on to develop a mental illness. It was a really interesting answer. Um, and I think it's good to know that it's not one or the other, um, but a combination of the two. Yeah. It's like the stars have to align, which is kind of scary, really. Um, we've got the results from your poll, um, which mm. you asked, are you interested in pursuing a career in STEM? And 75% or 74%, so nearly three quarters, said yes. Um, oh, that's really 9 cool. 9% said no, and 17% said maybe. So an mm. overwhelming um, response there. Um, and I think that nicely leads into our last question for you, because we're running out of time. Why did you yeah. science? So um, if you ask my parents how I got into science, their favorite story is how when I was a child, I declared one day, um, I'm going to become a scientist and I'm going to make new medicines to help people. And I remember this started because I was in the car, we were probably going to soccer or dancing or something. And um, I heard a story on the radio about how a new potential treatment for cancer had been found. And I thought, hey, 
I want to do that. And so this story is actually stuck with me because um, I will often um, give talks on the radio or write articles for newspapers because um, I have a, I just feel that people need to see um, that these careers exist and that actually they have the capacity to do it if they really want to. So um, after this, um, I want to kill the world of disease um, story. I, like most people, actually bounced back and forth quite a bit um, with all the things that I wanted to do. So I wanted to be a vet, a marine biologist, an artist, a doctor. And I was always very ambitious um, and also interested in everything. But I think um, most of my ideas were always based around science. So the origins for my love of science came from um, my very active um, and outdoor lifestyle growing up as a child. So I was always outside in the bush. I knew all of the local creeks and rivers and would play there with my brother. My dad's a tradesman and he would often be outside making things with wood and metal. And I was always outside with him. I wanted to be with him um, learning how things worked. I wanted to hammer. I wanted to screw. I wanted to use his tools and know what they all work for. Um, and so I think that this fascination with how things worked in the outdoors really um, drove my interest in science. And um, at school, I was good at biology. Um, and this flowed into being encouraged to study medicine, which I think happens to a lot of people. So when I finished school, I decided I'll take a medical science degree and then I'll probably go and study medicine at the grad school in Wollongong. But as I neared the end of my studies, I realized that actually I really just enjoy the science part. And so that's what I wanted to do. So I also want to mention that I'm a first generation academic, which means that I'm the first person in my family who went to university. And um, I think this posed some challenges for me, but not any that I couldn't overcome. Um, and a lot of the time, especially early on, well, sometimes even still now, I just have no idea what I'm doing. No, especially when I was younger. But I pressed on and I kept at it. And I really have a deep belief that perseverance can get you anywhere if you just follow your passion. So a lot of people um, say, when you say I have a PhD, I'm a research scientist, they go, oh my goodness, you must be so smart. And I honestly just don't believe that's true. I don't believe that I'm any smarter than anyone else. I just think that it has to do with having the passion and just being a really hard worker. So um, the only thing, um, if I could go back now, um, I think that I would try to find a mentor quite early on that could have helped me navigate university a little better. And um, I think that's probably the best advice that I could give to young people who are thinking about pursuing um, educate, uh, tertiary education. So going to uni and protect, particularly if you're thinking about going into the STEM sector. So I'm really, um, I'm really glad that there are so many people that are, that are here tonight that are interested in doing this kind of career. And um, yeah, and I just want you to know that you, you, can, you can do it. It's, a, it's hard work, but really anyone can do it. So um, now I love science because I love learning new things. And I think the most amazing part of my job is that often I'll be looking down a microscope or doing some analyses and I'll see something. And I'll know in that moment that I am probably because I can't know exactly, but I'm probably the first person in the world that currently holds that knowledge. And for me, that's just the best thing ever. So um, while I still have the stage quickly, I just want to wrap up by saying that postmortem human brain tissues are treated with the utmost respect and care. And due to all the resources that are needed to find brain donations and then prepare them for research, they're quite a limited resource. So if you think that you might like to donate your brain to scientific research, you can Google brain bank donor program to search for your closest bank. They exist all around the world. We have a couple of them in Sydney. And if you need help finding the place to inquire about a brain donation to you, feel free to contact me. I'm on Twitter. You can just Google my name, Natalie Madison, and my contact details will come up and I'll be happy to help you find um, the information that you need. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to thank all of the participants and their families who are already part of these programs. And also lastly, um, I really wanna thank my mentors and my lab group because science is really a team sport. And I think that it's super um, important to acknowledge that this isn't just about me and the work that I do, but it's about what we do as a team. Thank you. Thanks, Nisha. Uh, sorry, thanks, Natalie. Um, that was a really inspirational story um, about how you got into science. Um, and after listening to Nisha's talk um, and Lara's talk and your talk tonight, um, donating my brain is definitely something that I'll be looking into. Um, 
So thank you for a brilliant talk tonight, Natalie. It was really eye-opening. And thank you to everyone who attended and asked questions. If you want to watch this talk again, or you know someone who would have enjoyed it, then we'll be posting it on our website in the coming week. You'll also receive a post-event email in the next 24 hours with an evaluation survey. Please fill this out as it helps us to gauge the success of our events and make improvements for next year. We couldn't run Soapbox Science Sydney without our sponsors, so I'd like to thank the University of Technology Sydney, Excite on Science, Equus, and the University of Wollongong for their continued support. We have so many more great talks lined up over the next three nights, starting tomorrow with Hannah Law at 7 p.m., talking about training our immune system to work harder, something that we could all do with during this pandemic. You can join all of these talks from the link you're on now, or you can find more information on our website, soapboxsciencesydney.com. Thank you for attending, and we hope to see you all again tomorrow night.